you know, I almost hate to end this series because there's just so many things that I want people to believe in God's miracles. We live in a world today where a lot of people don't find hope many places. And I want people to always believe that in God, there's always hope. And today, if you've got your Bibles, if you would open to the Gospel of Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. If you ever need to believe God for miracles, Luke chapter 8 is one of the greatest chapters in the whole Bible. Luke was a historian, and he wrote his book through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but he wrote it to speak to the readers about, he wanted people to know who Jesus was. And so there's some perspectives that you get from Luke And in Luke chapter 8, it's almost like he pressed in all of these miracles in one chapter. Beginning in chapter 8, he talks about where Jesus took his disciples and he took them out to to the sea and he put them in a boat. And as soon as they got into the boat, the storm began to hit them and and waves began to come and Jesus was laying in the boat asleep. He gets up and he speaks to the storm. And and in that moment, the storm that was raging that they thought was going to kill them, all of a sudden the storm ceased. He leaves that story and he goes to the next story and he takes Jesus to the land of the Gadarenes. And as soon as Jesus steps on the the soil of the Gadarenes, a a demoniac comes. A man who is filled with demons comes. And all of a sudden he cast out the demons out of his life. And today we're going to look at Jairus and see what God does in his life. And then he compresses it in with the woman with the issue of blood. So in Luke chapter 8, there's four miracles that take place. The first miracle shows that Jesus has power over the elements. There's not anything that can come and come into that world from the outside that Jesus cannot come. He then took us to the the Gadarenes. It shows us that Jesus has power over all demons. Then he takes us to the story with the woman with the issue of blood to show that Jesus has all power over sickness. For Jairus, he says, with the one, he has a daughter that's dead. And Jesus raises her up to show that Jesus has all power over death. Which is teaching us that Jesus, in his miracle power, has power over all things. Now today, we want to talk about faith. I think the hardest part is discovering faith because most of the time you don't need faith if you're not in the middle of a crisis. If you just live in your day, you don't think about faith. But there's an important question in this story. When he first got to the disciples and that storm was raging and he calmed the storm, he asked them this question, where is your faith? And I would like to tell everybody here today, it would be nice to believe, well, everybody's got faith, you at church. But what happens when you meet that crisis? Do you have faith to make it through that moment? And so today, I want us to look in the Word, and I want to hopefully help all of us. Where do you find faith? Where do you find a miracle in the middle of a crisis? Sometimes we all deal with situations that we don't have answers for. Situations that we don't understand. Why do people go through hard times? But I want you to know that faith, how do you find faith in the middle of that moment? Because I think Jesus would look at all of us today and say, where's your faith? Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, I pray today 
Lord, that you would just help us, help me. God, to know where I can go in those crisis moments where I don't have the answer. God, there's just things I see in people's life that I wish I could fix. I wish I could change. And God, when I don't have the answer, God, I know that the answer is in you and faith. So today, Jesus, I'm asking you, would you help somebody? Would you help me? God, that I would know where to look when I don't have the answer. And Father, I thank you, God, that you are here. And Lord, that you would just speak through your word to people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I don't know about you, but the older I get, the more I see people going through difficult days. And many days I go home and I pray that God would help me to say the right words to people when I don't have the answer. It's a human quality in all of us that we want to say exactly what people need in a moment of crisis. But I've found that in humanity, we're just small. We don't have the capability to fix everybody's problems. We spend a lot of our time trying to be problem fixers for situations, but the, the answers sometimes are much bigger than us. And so in those moments, I've been looking. God, would you help me to be able to tell people how to make it through those times in their life? And I pray that Luke chapter 8 is going to be that type of chapter for you today. The pressure is not on me today because God gave us this word that we can always lean on his word and it will never fail us. And I believe Luke chapter 8 is that type of word today. So... Would you look in verse 41? The Bible says, And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet, and he besought him that he would come to his house. For he had only one daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was laying there dying. But as he went, the people began to throng him or press upon him. And all of a sudden, a woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years, who had spent everything that she had, she had went to every doctor she could see, and nobody could heal her, came from behind him and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood was stopped. Jesus said, who touched me? And when all the people had denied it, Peter and everybody around said, Master, there's so many people how will we know who touched you? Jesus said, somebody touch me. For I perceive that the virtue has gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she had, was not hid, she came forth trembling and falling down before him. She declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was immediately healed. And he said unto her daughter, be of good comfort. Your faith has made you whole. Go in peace. And when he had spake these words, there cometh one from the ruler of the synagogue to him, saying to them, Your daughter is dead. Stop troubling the master. Mm. That's hard to believe, ain't it? That's unbelievable that, that in that moment. But notice... Jesus said when he heard the conversation that was going on, he said, fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. When he came into the house, he suffered no man to go in except for Peter, James, and John, and the father and the mother of the maiden. And, and all wept and bewailed her, but he said, weep not, she is not dead, but she is sleeping. They laughed him to scorn and knowing that she was dead. And he put them all out and he took her by the hand and called to her and said, Made arise. And her spirit came again and she arose straightway and he commanded 
to give her meat. Her parents were astonished, but he charged them that they should not tell any man what was done. I believe there's three ways that we can learn faith in this story of Jairus. Three things that I want to leave you with today that when you go through situations and you don't have an answer for, where do you find faith? That's the question that he asked the disciples. Where's your faith? Meaning it's lost. How do you find it? And you know, as we live on this earth, there's going to be times in our life where crisis will come. Most people at some point in their life will go through a crisis moment. And my hope is that the word of God would lead you to a foundation that you cannot find in any earthly wisdom, but only in the wisdom of heaven. So this story tells us that they was, after Jesus had stepped back from the land of the Gadarenes, all of a sudden, the Bible tells us people met them and they were glad that Jesus had showed up. And from there, this ruler of the synagogue shows up. The ruler of the synagogue was responsible for who led the Bible reading, who taught the principles. He was very religious. And if I were to be really honest with you, if you were to ask him a day before this scenario, what do you think about Jesus? I bet he would have said, well, he may be a prophet. I hear he may be a good teacher, but I don't know if he's the son of God. But all of a sudden, Luke tells us on this day that as soon as Jesus stepped off the boat, he came running to Jesus. And he fell down at his feet and he said, I've got a daughter, my only daughter, and she's dying. You see, crisis brings sometimes an initial faith that you can't get until you go through it. Crisis brings those moments that you don't know what to do and you are looking for an answer. And maybe yesterday you would have never went to Jesus. But today something has changed in your life and you are looking for the only hope you can find. And that's what brought Jairus to this moment. It was a crisis moment of faith. And a lot of people would say, well, I've heard people say, well, the only reason they came to church, they in crisis. You know what this story tells me? Jesus don't care how you get to him. He just wants you to come. Can I just tell somebody here today? Praise God, you didn't come in a crisis moment because maybe life may be like you're sailing on the clear blue seas, but maybe for somebody, you are in a crisis and I'm glad to know that the King of Kings, the God who sits on the throne of this world, even when you come on crisis, He will meet you at your need in the hour that you need Him. You see a lot of people, you, we'd probably be that way, wouldn't we? Well, the only way you looking down at Jairus and say, well, I've been walking around for three years. I ain't never seen you before, Jairus. But not the Jesus that we know. He is the God of miracles, but he's also a God of compassion. He's a God that says, I see you as you are, and I welcome you right to my feet so that I can do what no man can do for you in this hour. Aren't you glad that we come to a place? I call it the church, not the building that we are in, but the body of believers where the word of God tells us that no matter what you are going through, there is a place at the throne room of God that God can meet you in your hour of need. Hey, we didn't meet at Walmart today. We didn't meet at the buffet today. We came to a place that bears the name of Jesus Christ. Why did we come here in the name of Jesus Christ? Because we believe that he has the answer for everything that we are going through in our life. And we are not left 
without an answer. Boy, when I read this, I thought, how many, if we were the judge, we'd be telling everybody, well, I wish you'd have come three years ago. I've been walking around. I've been waiting on you. But Jesus didn't do that. The Bible says he fell down at his feet. And what did Jesus do next? He started going to him. You see, the first thing that we need in our life is that initial faith. What brought you to initial faith? And if we were to be honest, everybody in this church has been through some crisis at some point in your life. And I promise you, at that moment, something inside of you, maybe you have never prayed like you prayed in that moment. Maybe you never sought God like you did in that moment. But I, it, when I read this, I thought, you know what? We better tell people that no matter what they're going through in their life, Jesus is available to help them in that hour of need. No matter how bad it looks right now, Jesus is available to help people in their need. Whether it's a crisis moment or not, Jesus is available. Initial faith. All of a sudden, the Bible tells us that Jesus began going toward Jairus' house. And the, the, there were so many people pressing in. And all of a sudden, the Bible says that there came a woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years. And Jesus stopped. And as he stopped, the people began to circle all around him. That's why the crowd was there. They were actually following Jesus to Jairus' house. They were following Jesus because guess what? I don't know if they were skeptical. I don't know if they just came to see a miracle. But they wanted to know one thing. What will Jesus do for Jairus? You know, maybe there's somebody here today. You came by. You heard we were talking about miracles and you just wanted to hear. What can Jesus do in crisis? Huh. I hope that you will find that. We can do nothing but the God that we've sung about, the God that we've prayed to, and the God that we are reading his word can do everything in the middle of a crisis. And they were pressed in around him, and the woman with the issue of blood comes, and she touches the hem of his garment. Now, let's just be real. I wonder how many people I have right now in the church that you would admit that if you was Jairus, you just told Jesus that your daughter was dead and you were, or it's dying and you needed him to come. And all of a sudden, Jesus has stopped. How patient would you be? Be honest. How many mama bears I got in here? <laughs> your little girl's sick at home and all of a sudden, Jesus is trying to walk down the street and all of a sudden, he stopped. I wonder if you'd have been like, hey, whoa, whoa, let's get back on point, Jesus. I told you my daughter's dying. Oh, I see this woman has a need, but guess what? My need is even greater. <laughs> I guarantee you there's some impatient people here. You'd have had a hard time. You down there at the walk-in clinic, and they waiting an hour to get you in. You impatient there. And here's the woman with the issue of blood, and now Jesus has stopped. He stopped. And all of a sudden, Jesus turns around. And he says, who? Somebody's touched me. Peter, Peter goes, there's too many people around everybody. How are we going to find out who touched you, Jesus? Notice in this situation, the crowd was all around him. But only one person reached out to touch him. You can have a crowd, but God needs somebody that's willing to reach out and touch him sometimes. You see, sometimes the crowd will gather around, but somebody's going to have faith to go, hey, let me reach out. If nobody else won't believe, let me reach out and touch him. Huh. She reached out and touched him, and all of a sudden he's looking around, and he says, virtue has left me. The woman, knowing that Jesus felt this, she looks up and she says, I've had this issue for 12 years. One thing that you find that you need to know about faith, a lot of people would say that I just see all the barriers why Jesus won't do a miracle in my life. 
I've heard people sometimes talk about the barriers a lot more than they talk about faith. Can I tell you there's a link between the Gadarenes, Jairus' daughter, and the woman with the issue of blood. Nobody would go to that place where the Gadarenes were because that was the land of the dead. It was socially unacceptable to be around a demoniac. But Jesus broke the social barrier and he went to the land to find the demoniac. The second barrier that he broke was when the woman with the issue of blood, when you had this type of situ situation, medically, nobody wanted to be around this woman. She was deemed unclean for society. The barrier said, because of your condition, you can never get close to Jesus. The third barrier was when there was somebody that was dead. Religiously, no one could touch the body. I want to tell you today, the barrier that social would put in society to say, no matter where you came from, Jesus is willing to change your life. No matter what barrier that medical. I've heard people say, well, you know, I've got this medical situation and, and I just don't feel comfortable. And, and if we were to be honest, I guarantee you there's probably somebody in this church or been around people where somebody had a medical condition and, and people just stayed away from them. Many times it's a religious barrier. People say, well, you know, I've, I hadn't been religious all of my life. Look what I look like. People won't accept me in church. I hear that barrier all the time. Can I just tell somebody today that the grace that Jesus died on that cross breaks every barrier for whatever miracle you need in your life. It don't matter what socially people say about you. It doesn't matter what your medical condition is. It don't matter what religion you have come from. The grace of Jesus Christ breaks down every barrier and everybody is welcomed into his kingdom through the blood of Jesus Christ. And here, this woman with the issue of blood Nobody was supposed to be around her. And all of a sudden, Jesus says these words to her. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Why did Jesus make that declaration? There's three reasons that I believe that Jesus made a declaration like that. Number one, he called her out publicly. So that for the first time in her life, she could be accepted. Every other time in her life, she was the woman who had the issue of blood. Which means she could not be around her friends. She could not be around a job. She couldn't be around her church. But when Jesus, why do you think he spoke it? He wanted to tell everybody, the woman that you used to tell couldn't be here. She is made well and whole. And now for all of you that could not be around her, I want to declare to all of you, she is no longer the woman with the issue of blood. She is a daughter of the king. And now you must welcome her back to everything that has been lost out of her life. Praise God, if you let Jesus get a hold of you, whatever barrier that you thought was going to keep you out, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, the blood was sufficient, and now you can be accepted into his kingdom according to his word. Aren't you glad that there's acceptance through Jesus Christ in his word? Huh. The second thing is, not only was it a declaration to everybody else, but when, when this happened, it was letting the world know. It was letting the world know that she could be a part of what they were doing in her life. I want to tell you the second thing. 
Number one is crisis initial faith. The second thing is illustrative faith. Because this is the truth. When Jesus healed this woman, and all of a sudden, who was there beside him? Jairus. And so, all of a sudden, there was an illustration for Jairus to look at to say, my daughter's sick. Jesus just did it for her. I believe Jesus can do it for me. The second type of faith is when Jesus illustrates that he's done it in the past. He's done it for people. And so he's illustrating that he can do it for us. You know why we're doing these videos every week? I hope it's an illustration for you. Because the same God that did these miracles is the same God that can do your miracle. Sometimes we need illustrations, don't we? Don't we need those moments in our life where we're going, where is my faith? I'm in crisis. I want to see it to believe that God can do it for me. And here's Jairus walking along. His daughter is dying. And all of a sudden, he's watching Jesus touch this woman. I mean, this woman touched Jesus. And Jesus is saying, daughter, you, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. I guarantee you, he declared that. So Jairus could hear the miracle that had just been performed. Now, immediately following that, Immediately following that, somebody from the house shows up. If you look at that, somebody from the house shows up. And it says, while he yet spake to this woman, there cometh one from the ruler of the synagogue's house. And he says, your daughter's dead. Quit bothering the master. I mean, it's the worst news that he could have got. At that moment, every bit of doubt and frustration had to enter his life. Think about it. I guarantee you, if we were to be honest, human, the human part of us would have gone, if we just wouldn't have stopped here, maybe Jesus would have got there and saved my daughter. I guarantee you. And if you, if you would lay off your self-righteous clothes and be honest, you would probably feel that way, right? Boy, if Jesus wouldn't have stopped, he would have made it to my house and my daughter would still be here. But notice what Jesus said to him while the man was speaking. When Jesus heard it, he answered him and he said, fear not. Believe only and she shall be made whole. You see, we have an initial faith that comes through crisis sometimes in our life. When you don't know what to do, the Bible is full of illustrations. People are full of illustrations of what Jesus can do. But I want to give you the third one right here in this verse that I think is very, very important for all of us to take when you don't know what to say. And I'm finding more and more in those moments in my life, I'm finding people who are going through crisis moments and I want so badly to be able to give them something. And this verse gives me more hope than anything else I could say. Number one, you have initial faith. Number two, you have illustrative faith. But sometimes... You need instruction faith. What is instruction faith? Not what I say. But let me just tell you what Jesus said about your situation. You see, we want the words, but we don't have to come up to the words. We just have to say what the word tells us. And when the middle of that moment, when that man, when Jairus was standing there and the man came running up and he said, your daughter's dead. It's over. The Bible says Jesus heard it. And he said, instructing him, you got to block that out of your mind and you need to put fear out the door and you have to believe. 
Oh, everybody didn't get that. You see, we want somebody to fix our problems, but I'm just telling you the only one that can fix them is Jesus Christ. And the first thing you got to do is quit listening to everybody tell you that it's dead. And I want to tell you about a man that says, hey, you got to get that out of your mind. That's death. But let me tell you what I can do. Believe, 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 believe. And when you don't know what to do, believe, believe. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost trying to make somebody wake up here today. You got to tell somebody, I don't care if it's your best friend. Cut them off your Facebook. Cut them off your Instagram. Lose their number and put your faith in the one and believe in Jesus Christ. He's the only one. And he said, she can be made well. Amen. I guarantee you today, that's a hard thing to do. But that's what he said. He instructed. He gave instructions. Can you imagine the look that, J that Jairus, <laughs> I bet he looked Jesus in the eye. And Jesus looked through those eyes of heaven and was pierced. And he said, you got to believe, son. You got to believe, son. You got to believe. I know what it looks like, but you got to believe. And it tells us in verse 51. And when he came into the house, he suffered no man to go in except for Peter, James, and John. He took Peter, James, and John. Why Peter, James, and John? I told you this is instructive faith. He took Peter, James, and John to give them instruction. What instruction did he give them? Well, he knew that he was going to ascend to heaven. And the power of the Holy Spirit was going to be descended down upon the church. And Peter, James, and John were going to be in that upper room. And what he was trying to do was tell them, son, Peter, James, and John, I'm going to leave, but I'm going to leave you with a power, and I want you to see what I did so that you can believe that God can use you to do the same thing. Oh, I'm telling somebody here today, there's a Peter, James, and John that you need to understand that the same way that Jesus did it, the same Holy Ghost that's inside of us, that God is still doing miracles even right now inside the body of Christ. How do I know this? If you got time, turn to the book of Acts chapter 9. What was Jesus showing them? He had the power over death. He showed him he had power over the elements. He showed him that he had power over demons. He showed him that he had power over sickness. And now he brought them to the moment they have that Jesus has power over death. Nobody has power over death. But he took Peter, James, and John. Woo. Peter was full with the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 2. Now, years later, Jesus has ascended. The Bible says that Peter went to Joppa. There was a disciple there or a girl that was there. Her name was Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. This woman was excelling in acts of kindness and charity, which she did habitually. Man, this, you know, this blows the whole theory that you can be good enough for bad things not to happen in your life. We, we like to be religious sometimes. Well, if I'm good enough, ain't nothing bad going to happen. While you live here on this earth, you're going to face crisis, right? So here's Peter. But it happened at that time that she became sick and died. What? She's making blankets for the poor. Dorcas has died. And the Bible says when they had washed her body, they laid her in an upstairs room. Huh. Since Lida was near Joppa, the disciples, having heard that Peter was there, sent two to them saying, urge and don't delay, come to us. We got a crisis. So Peter got ready. When he arrived, they brought him into the room upstairs and all the, the widows stood beside him weeping and showing all their tunics and garments that Dorcas used to make while she was there. Peter walks into the room and everybody's crying and they got a blanket that she gave to somebody's mama who was sick. She's got a blanket that she gave to somebody's baby when they were born. And they're just, they're in disarray. What are we going to do? 
And all of a sudden, Peter said to all of them, he knelt down and he prayed. Turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. What made Peter? Now, I'm going to tell you some things about this story. It's almost verbatim what happened when Jesus was at Jairus' house. Because when Jesus walked in, he told everybody, get out of the room. Now, I want to tell somebody here today, you, when you're going through a crisis in your life, you got to get everybody else out of the room. Why do you need to get people out of the room? Because if there's any doubt in the room, you don't want it around when you're going through that situation. You don't need anybody. You say, well, how do you know that? The Bible is clear about this story. In 2 Kings chapter 4, when Elisha, when the Shunammite woman, when her son had died, the Bible says that she sent for Elisha. When Elisha got to the house, house the Bible says that he went up into the room and when he entered into the room what did he do he shut the door behind him he didn't invite nobody he didn't invite the neighbor across the street he didn't put it on Facebook all he said was I need a God moment in my life I gotta shut the door because I believe that God can only fix what I'm going through in my life shut the door when Jesus went to Jairus' house, he invited Peter, James, and John, and the mama and the daddy. And what did he do? He ran everybody else out of the room. When Peter went to Dorcas' house, he said he drove everybody out of the room. And what did Jesus, he walked in there, and the Bible says he grabbed her by the hand. And he said, arise and get up. Can I tell somebody here today, maybe you're going through a moment that you don't have an answer for. Can I believe that the word of God is true enough to tell you it's time to get up? Turn to your neighbor and say, it's time to get up. Hey, it's crisis. I don't care. It's time to get up. Because you know what? When we are going through those moments in our life, it's easy for us to sit down and think about why it cannot happen. And we're laying there and we're trying to figure it out. But Jesus said, no, no, no. I didn't come to this house for you to stay lying down on the bed. I came to this house so you can get up and you can know that my power is real. Tell somebody it's time for you to get up. Get up. Boy, if the church, I'm not talking about physically dead. I'm talking about spiritually dead people right now. I'm telling somebody you think that your life has got problems, but guess what? I came by to tell you, you shut the door and Jesus says, it's time to get up. Get up. Get up. It ain't time to die. You still here. You still got life. You still got potential. You got destiny. God's got something for all of us. Get up. You realize that the church just started getting up again. All this stuff we complaining about in the world might have to get out. Can I tell somebody, if the church would get up, some of that would get out. The problem of the church is we still sitting down, want it to get out. God's telling the church, you got to get up so it'll get out of here. We have the authority. And the blood of Jesus Christ and the power of his spirit. He took Peter, James, and John. Why? He was trying to instruct them. This is what the power can do in a situation. Get up. And I'm here to tell you today, church. If he did it for Peter, James, and John, I believe he'll do it for us today. I believe he wants to do it today. He asked all of us, where's your faith? And the truth is, there's moments you don't know what to do in that. But maybe you'll find some initial faith. Maybe some illustrations from the word. But most of all, I pray that you'll just go off the instruction of the word. The instruction of the word tells us, shut the door. 
Speak to it. Arise and get up. And guess what? She got up. Now, if you go back to Jairus' story, I do. It's so funny to me. And I don't, I don't, I wish I could tell you I knew exactly. When Jesus got her up in Luke chapter 8, he said, give her something to eat. Can you find that in Luke chapter 8? Pick up where that's at for me. What verse is it? When she got her up, she rose straightway. Notice what the last part, that's perfect. He said, get her up. And give her something to eat. I mean, that's kind of Jesus we got. Get up. Let's go to the buffet. (laughs) You know why most scholars believe that he did that? Because everybody outside of that room would think that it was an afterlife experience. Almost like she wasn't real. Like it was... Uh, a fake like maybe she had a demon or, or something from the spiritual world that she's still dead but Jesus told somebody go get her some biscuits because I want y'all to know she's real the same girl that y'all said was dead she ain't just alive but she's eating a buffet inside the room she ain't just breathing she's in here eating room service inside all of those people that was outside crying and and saying it can't be done all of a sudden here comes somebody through the den can you imagine the door opening up jesus said go get her something to eat can you imagine the mourners were like she was just dead All of a sudden, here they come with a table of bread. Knock on the door. What in the world are you doing? She just died. No, she ain't dead. Jesus is in here feeding her right now. The same one you said that there was no hope. She's in here not only breathing, but she's eating. She is a real living miracle in her life. Woo! I don't know about you. I guess if Jesus woke me up from being dead. Supper sounds good, right? Hey, I want something good. Go get me one of them Chick-fil-A pimento cheese sandwiches. Good. Where's Brother Leon at, man? Them things are good. I went with him eating the other day. He got two of them. I, don't, I know he looks skinny. Get me some Chick-fil-A. God's chicken. I'm joking. He commanded her, go get her something to eat. The next verse in verse 56, and her parents were astonished, but he charged them that they should tell no man what was done. You see, when we have a platform for Jesus, it's not what we say, it's how we live. We we live in a world today that's got a lot to say, but not a lot to live. I believe God wants us to live miracle faith in our life. I mean, what good does it do to put every post on there and then they see us acting like heathens everywhere else? Really? I mean, I'm serious. Just live it. Just live it. And sure enough, it happened. I'm going to give you something in closing that's very, very, very dear to me. I, I'm sure I've told this at some point over the years so far. Hey, I'm getting old, and sometimes you tell the same story. You have to forgive me, okay? <laughs> had a very good friend of mine. Her name was Miss Rhonda, and she had cancer. She gave me the most prolific understanding of what to do about faith in hard times of life. She had cancer that she battled for 10 years. And she was not doing well. And I went to see her one day. And I was asking her how she was doing, how she made it through all this time. And she taught me something about how to believe. The first thing she said, when you go through those moments in your life, You have to believe in the power of agreement. 
Matthew chapter 8 and verse 19, what does it say? Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything, that you may ask it and it shall be done to them by my Father in heaven. The number one thing the church has to do is come into agreement together. You need to find somebody that will believe with you. You do. You don't have the answer. You need somebody to believe with you. And I pray that inside of this church, there's people that will believe with you. Now, when I say believe, they'll shut the door and doubt, and you know they're going to believe with you. Number two, she said, honestly, sometimes in my life, I had to have people believe for me when I couldn't believe for myself. She was very, very honest with me. This is almost 20 years ago, and I, I remember sitting beside her and listening to her frail voice. She said, Bob, there's just some days the fight is very hard, and, and I, it's hard on me, and I need somebody to believe with me. And so in Mark's gospel, I think the scripture on Mark, the Bible says that there was this men who dug through the house and they lowered the man who was paralyzed down to Jesus. And when they lowered him down, the Bible says when they were unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him and they let down the paralyzed man, which is paralyzed man was laying. And then it says, Jesus, notice what this verse says. It's very important. Jesus seen their faith. Son, your sins are forgiven. Sometimes you may be going through situations and you don't feel like you can. God wants you to put some people around you that has their faith for you. Their faith for you. And last but not least, she said, you know what? Over 10 years, there were some days where I didn't know if anybody was believing with me. But I had to have faith to believe for myself. Can I just tell you today, you got to have some faith to believe for yourself. When David was going through a very hard time in his life, the enemy had came, got their children, got their wives, and took everything. The Bible said that he was scared that his own brothers around him were going to stone him. But notice what it says. David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. You may go through some lonely days of your life and you may be questioning, is anybody believing with me? But some days you got to have the faith to just believe for you. It may not be anybody else believing with you that day. There may not be anybody there to encourage you, but David strengthened himself. And I want to tell you today, church, principles of faith usually only come out of hard times. I'm sorry. They don't come while, while you got plenty in the bank, your cars are running good, your children are acting right, you've been doing 50 sit-ups a day, you look it in the mirror and you look all buff. Faith don't matter then. But when somebody comes up to you and gives you the worst news of your life, God says, you still got to believe.